Welcome back to Play Tessie. It's episode 51. And if you're listening on drop day, it's March 13th. Episode 51. I want Daniel Bard's writing a book with Bradfo, so I like want to go with Bardo. But Mike Julian Timlin, Tavares. Right? Timlin, yes. I, I left Timlin off. I wanted I want to go with Julian Tavares. Because like, how could you not go with Julian Tavares? You, the, you rubber, have the the man who had Manny rub his head and roll the ball to first base to Kevin Euclid. Absolute legend. Look up his Instagram when you get a chance. He's a, he still has a good time out there. 51 um, is weird, man. We don't have many 51s. I'm looking right now while I'm trying to get to 51. Dude, it's about to get so hard. Like, imagine when we get to, like, the 80s. Oh, dude. <laughs> the finale of this of this little intro is going to be the Alex Verdugo episode. <laughs> oh. That's going to oh. be the last one. There's... Anyone else one wore uh, 99 on the Reds? Well, we'll get to it. We're only a few episodes away from that. Yeah, we'll keep we'll keep the mystery. We'll keep the mystery. But this is the official podcast of Apple products breaking down every 51 minutes. It's a thing. I went to the Apple store today and had to get my AirPods fixed, my iPhone port fixed. And now we are starting this podcast like 15 to 20 minutes late because my computer needed needs to get fixed. Like, oh, Gordo. It's a disaster. Charlie Zink. Remember him? Yeah, the what well, he he had one game and he got blast. He was knuckleballer, right? Yeah, he was a knuckleballer, Charlie Zink. Oh my! And he got blasted. The Red Sox won that game like twenty something to something teen. Also, wasn't Mike Timlin fifty, not fifty one? Yes, I just confirmed fifty. He's fifty. Who then? 50. Who else did I miss? I missed a fifty one. I like. He, I, okay, here's one. Who did I leave off? I purposely left one off. Or not purposely. I decided to leave one off. That was there. Okay, tell me why this guy is incredibly significant in the history of the Boston Red Sox. He wore number 51, Heathcliff Slocum. Jason Barrett, Tech, Derek Lowe. Yep. Wow, wow. Very good, very good, Pat. Shout out the uh, Mariners for that incredibly lopsided trade. Another one, Byung Hyung Kim. Oh, God. He flipped off Red Sox fans or Diamondbacks fans? I think Red Sox fans. <laughs> Fuck them both. Fuck them both. But this is also the official Red Sox podcast at WEI. Before we get going today, remember, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, Odyssey app, remember to hit that subscribe button. Rate us five stars. Leave a comment. Do all that good stuff. Check us out on YouTube. We're on WEI's page. We got our own playlist. Uh, hit that thumbs up there. Check us out there. And follow us on all the socials at PlayTessie on Twitter and Instagram. Here with Sammy and Pat Coops in the background today. Not a whole lot going down. Today's spring training game wasn't on TV, which stunk because Rafael went deep again. Trevor's story was Story went nuts. Dude, we were talking about him struggling, and now all of a sudden his like, spring training OPS is over 1,000. and He's, he's hitting like 360. 360. Like, oh, yeah, he's hitting 360. He got another hit. It's one of those guys like, you know, we've talked about this before. Like, we don't like to freak out about spring training stats, but story after a few weeks, we were like, oh, my God, he looks just like how he looked when he came right. back from the elbow injury. Now he's he's cooking. He looks like Colorado's story. Comeback player of the year. Book it. I that if the if Trevor's story actually won comeback player of the year, that would change the entire outlook. And like, we can't go down this rabbit hole because like we really do need to see it for an extended period of time in real major league games before we can like let our minds, or at least for me before I can let my mind get there. But like, if he, if that were to happen, if he were to ex- even sniff that thing, like, Holy crap. Like that, that would be your three hitter. We've been talking about the three hitter thing all off season. Well, even if he doesn't hit that well plays, you know, gold glove defense at short average hitter could be the comeback player of the year. It's still yeah. super valuable. Let's go socks. Be a real kick in the nutsack. If it was Chris sale. I would like. I'm I'm rooting for Chris Sale, regardless of how too. he. I am too. I still win the trade with the Braves. You got Grissom for like six years, so we'll see. We'll see. That's going to be so annoying hearing people lament that trade. Oh. I know. Isn't that the most? I don't know. I don't know about you guys. You give me your take on this. I hate, and you see it. You saw it all last year with Xander. I hate when these players that were so great for us and like they were our favorite guys when they were here. And then they leave to go somewhere else and people like highlight anytime they do something not good and like shit on them. It's like, are we really shitting on Xander Bogart right now? What the hell? You're small. If you do that, you're just small. That's a small person move. Like you're, you're, you're little and 
grow up. That's so there. Lame. There are some exceptions though. Oh, like well, Verdugo, yeah. Verdugo is a. That's different. That's different though. PK. Yeah. That's way different. Like he's yeah. like if you were like a jackass for any period of time, you're like yeah, like by all means, like sale. Like, like, Xander, no, not sale. sale. Like, yeah, like Vasquez. PK. Yeah, no, don't definitely not Vasquez. You're allowed to do it to Kike. You're yep. allowed to do it to Verdugo. You're allowed to do it to Damon. You're Anyone goes to, to the it. Yankees, you can do it for yeah. the Yankees. Or someone who like shit talks on the way out. Yeah, if like we even, see I mean, even like Manny and the Sox had an incredibly ugly divorce, and people never did that to Manny. Yeah. So to do it to like a guy like Bogarts who did want to be here just didn't work out, it's pretty classless. Especially when the excuse for is he chased the money. Buddy, he got offered $280 million. Yeah. If he didn't chase the money, shortstop. Alex Cora said this. He would have like smacked him in the face if he didn't take yeah. the money. It's, it's, that's like generational, generational, generational wealth. So, yeah. We still love, Taylor, still love Sale. I'm speaking on behalf of everyone involved with Play Tessie. We love those guys. There's There's a few Twitter accounts out there that I see do that. A few times. I don't. I'm not going to give them the shout out, but I'll. Well, I'll. I'll tell you guys who I'm. Who I'm thinking of after. But if you do that and you're listening, you know who you are. Don't do that. We love Xander Bogarts. We love Chris Sale. We love Justin Turner. I don't want to hear any of that this year. We're gonna no sell you forever. Yep. But on the topic of guys that you can root for their failures, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Yankees today. <laughs> We've got some you interesting, know, interesting. You know, uh, they were pretty excited when Lucas Giolito got hurt, but I'm not going to stoop to that level. No, you shouldn't. No, no, we don't root for injuries, and that's not even sarcasm. We don't like, no, don't. like we're not going to do that. But we are blessed on this podcast to have Pat Brown. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. So we've got a couple of interesting Yankee. Injuries to break down to their to two of their three superstars. And I don't know, we should we should start it off with Garrett Cole. He got an MRI on his elbow that the Yankees said was preliminary. But and we'll get into some quotes later. Who knows if the Yankees actually believe that it's precautionary? Pat, when when Garrett Cole gets an MRI on his elbow, what goes through your mind? Um I don't know. I'm definitely not jumping to worst case. Well, best case for the Red Sox, worst case for the Yankees, Tommy John. Um, and then there's a lot of people who, and I really was on my phone today, but I did see a lot of people like being pretty frantic about the MRI results not being in. Um, the doctors who look at that stuff are with Lucas Giolito right now. So that's why the delay is there on that. Dr. Dugas and Dr. Andrews are the two uh, from the Andrews Institute are the two number one Tommy John UCL guys in the country. So I'm sure the results will probably be in tomorrow. If they're not in by like tomorrow night, that's a little odd. Well, that's this, very there was an odd. Interesting, there was an interesting quote. I'll read it off from Bob Clappish from MJ.com. Big clap. He, yeah, big, big clap guy. Um, the big clapper. <laughs> he, he, he's got the clap. <laughs> yeah, he does. He said, he said, quote, it'll be two to three days before the Yankees know for sure. Cole's MRI is being distributed to specialists for second and third opinions. If club officials were privy to the pre preliminary diagnosis on Monday, they kept a tight lid on it. Yeah. So when you got the MRI done, I would imagine the team doctors probably looked at it. The second and third opinions are probably Dr. Dugas and Dr. Andrews. So when it says two to three days, that's after Lucas Giolito surgery. Right. Like that's their schedule, you think? Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I'm not really too much into it. Um, it's definitely like not off my radar. Like it is very odd that it was so much elbow discomfort that they sent him for an MRI. Normally, people are pretty good about differentiating between like when I throw like my forearm, like if it it's like a reproductive with motion that indicates muscle. If after he's throwing, 
he and he's moving his wrist and his hand around. That looks like joint, which is UCL. But again, this could be anything from flexor strain, which is what Giolito had with the UCL tear. Something as basic as a flexor strain. He's down for a week, doesn't throw, and then he's ramping back up. Or it could be UCL. But um, I don't it know. Was, it was interesting because the way they said this whole thing went down was that Cole threw 50 pitches and his elbow after that, he said it felt like he threw a hundred pitches and he just said like it, he wasn't recovering at the rate that he would have expected to after an outing like that. And I think he did feel a little like something, something in the elbow at one point or another too. Yeah. But like, I think the, the main thing that prompted the MRI was that recovery thing. Yeah. So I'll give you a little, little anatomy lesson. Yes. Let's get it. Doc, okay. This is uh this is hashtag Pat's prognosis from yeah. Dr. P himself. So just, just, just speculation. Yeah. So your UCL, your ulnar collateral ligament, I'll show you here, is right here, runs right through here. Typically, if you have elbow pain, right here is where you feel that UCL. It's like right, almost like a C here. The muscles that do this, like flex your wrist, all of those muscles insert right here. So that's why it's so common to get like that medial elbow pain right here. And people freak out about it because they're literally right in the same location. It's like medial Whitlock inside. last year. Yeah. Medial inside or outside? Medial, medial is middle. Lateral is outside. Oh, I'm thinking of radial and lateral or whatever. Yeah, medials. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so that's why guys who get like forearm strains always get an MRI because it's right near that UCL. So okay. if he's pointing here saying right here hurts, right here doesn't feel like it should after I pitch, MRI. It's kind of just default thing. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just to more so cover your ass. And with a guy like that, you have you have to. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm not reading too much into the, like him needing an MRI. It's pretty, it, like it genuinely is a precautionary thing, especially if he's just. Yeah, I'm a little sore today, but um, I don't know. And who knows? Maybe it is UCL related. So we'll know. I would imagine uh, Gilito's getting surgery tomorrow, right? No, I think he got it today. Okay. Got so it we today. got it today. So we should know tomorrow. Yeah, they'll they'll say tomorrow about what surgery Gilito got. Like maybe you already know by the time you're listening to this. And then yeah, Cole could be tomorrow, could be the day after. I don't know. But oh, that's interestingly nice. enough. Know. We don't even know what kind of surgery Giolito got at this point. It's Tuesday night. That's wild. I, I kind of forgot about that. In my head, I'm like Tommy John. It's, I, I would bet a good amount it's full full blown Tommy John. Why not? Hopefully yeah. it's not. It's Hopefully Tommy. it's not. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um Pat, I have a question for you. Yeah. Garrett Cole, he's got a pretty, I guess you could say standard delivery. It's yep. very, very like fundamentally sound. However, you explained the last time we did a Pat's prognosis that like, and, and this is pretty common knowledge, the motion of pitching itself is unnatural. Yeah. Uh, is, how big of a benefit, and I know that it's hard to quantify, but like if you're able to just repeat your delivery, whether it's an unnatural delivery or not, how valuable is that? Because Garrett Cole, like for my money, is the most consistent at repeating his delivery. So there's definitely pros and cons. Um, in terms of like arm slot and tunneling, if you do the same thing over and over and over, your body does adapt to it in a way where it's like, like your body knows what's happening. Mm -hmm. That being said, thousands and thousands and thousands of cycles of repeated stress isn't going to really save or help your yeah. ligamentous property. So with a UCL, like, sure, like you can really, like you can really refine the mechanics. You can really pin down using the lower, like lower half of your body, keeping everything at that 40 degree slot, working out of the same tunnel, out of the same arm slot, things like that. But no matter what you do for most people, that repeated stress adds up. Yeah. And the Thank big you. thing with that is. High velocity throwers are the highest risk for UCL tears. 
So Garrett Cole's been pumping over a hundred for a couple of years now. Yeah. So if he's not there right now, and again, not wishing he needs Tommy John. If he's not there right now, that's incredible, awesome. But yeah, and I agree. Garrett Cole is so good at keeping the same exact mechanics. But yeah, it doesn't really go a long ways in terms of like long term injury prevention with that. Yeah, I Let's, mean, look like his innings pitched as well. I think this is relevant. Exactly. He's a horse. Yeah. 109 in last year, 2022, 200.2, 181 the year before that, COVID year before that. 212 in 2019, 200.1, 2018, 203. Like he's consistently, and then 2015, he threw 208. So he's consistently logging, not a lot of innings, but like the most innings and in maybe right. like close to the most. So it's not like yeah. this guy throws a lot. He throws the most. So, yeah. you know, jokes aside, like as much as we like to make fun of the Yankees and Garrett Cole, we don't want to see him get hurt. We want to whoop the Yankees yeah. ass at full health so we get that full satisfaction. Don't give the Yankee fans the, well, if we had Garrett Cole and if we had oh, Aaron yeah. Judge in his boom box, we would have won. So I, I I don't like, I think it's really lame when people celebrate injuries. It's worth talking about, but yeah, uh, yeah, we don't want to see that shit. That's bad. bad for the game. But it, I, I totally agree. And But it would be very interesting to see sort of how they pivot if he is, if this, if this worst case scenario or anything close to it comes to fruition, like it's, I don't know how you pivot from that because you're already so all in on this year, having traded so much prospect capital, particularly pitchers for Juan Soto and Alex Verdugo to rentals Soto in particular, like you yeah. go, you can't, it's not like with the Red Sox, Giolito goes down. It's like, okay, like maybe we like punt on this year. Cause if we weren't, if they weren't willing to spend on Montgomery now or before, they're certainly not going to. Now, with the Yankees, it's like if you make those moves for rentals and then Garrett Cole goes down and you do nothing and you miss the playoffs, like how do you how do you justify that? This is the risk. This is the risk of the Juan Soto trade. As jealous as we all were to see Yankees fans celebrating and the Yankees get arguably the best bat in Major League Baseball to pair with maybe the second best bat in Major League Baseball and Aaron Judge. This is the risk. Now they're pigeonholed into going for it. Right after the Cole news, we saw today Dylan Cease trade rumors picking up with the Yankees. And then, like, maybe Snell goes to the Yankees. They pay for him. They're kind of like, this could be legitimately a disaster for them because they have to go for it. You only but got so much for one year guaranteed. You might not have them next year. The Mets, for my money, sound like they're ready to go all in for soda. Yeah. If you yeah. don't make a good first impression with him in the Bronx, you got all those Yankee fans point. swing booing the team, leaving the stadium early. Like, you know, I mean, Red Sox fans do the same thing, to be fair. But the booing, yeah. though, the booing, though, that rubs guys the wrong. Like, that's a thing. Yeah. yeah. And especially like, you know, you have this um, small ballpark. It's very like intimate setting. Like, you're going to hear it, man. So uh, I'm not rooting for the Yankees, but I, I sympathize. I understand what the fan base is going through. Like, I feel like they oh. have to do something. You said Pure it, Gordon. fear. Red Sox don't have to do anything. This is already a bridge year. We're all like, okay, whatever. This ain't the year. They've won four rings in the last 20 years. Like, we can we can pump the brakes. We get it. Yankees are like, shit. We used to be the king of everything. We haven't won friggin' since Instagram has existed. And now we got Juan Soto only for a year. We got to go for it. So they're in a, they went from being in a great place to a really, really treacherous place. Who it's knows? Scary. What yeah. It's, it's scary. And, and, what might even be the scariest part? So with the Yankees situation financially right now, they're into that Cohen tax. If they sign Blake Snell, we'll say, I would say the most likely contract for Blake Snell at this point is one of those short-term deals with opt-outs. So let's say Three they sign. Say that again, Sammy. Three years. No, no, no. That's not high enough. Three, four. 120. No. no I'm just, high. let's use it as an example. 100. Though. 100, three for 100. So like okay. 33, uh, three. 33 a year. Guess what? For the Yankees, that 33 is 66. That's why this, that's why they haven't signed Blake Snell to this point. And that's why I don't think they're going to sign Blake Snell and oh reports. God. Andy Martino said it. Robert Murray said it like, no, this, this is not going to make the Yankees go after Blake Snell. What it might do is make them go after Dylan Cease. And we yeah. saw Bob Nightingale report today that, They've made a new offer for Dylan Cease, and it didn't necessarily include their 
one of their best prospects, Spencer Jones, who the White Sox really want. But like clearly the Yankees are nervous enough about what's going on here to start to push a little bit for Cease. Because Boone, even if it's not the worst case scenario, Boone said he has a hard time envisioning Garrett Cole being ready for opening day. So like they're already starting to pivot. And like obviously props them for pivoting. But if in one offseason you trade for Juan Soto, Alex Verdugo, and now Dylan Cease, who has multiple years of control, like that's a big, big, big hole punched right in your farm system. I don't like they they might need to do it, but that's gonna hurt. You know, <laughs> you know I don't want to make fun of like the injury shit, but I was just thinking. Yankees opening day is in Houston. And you gotta think like they're they're thinking, all right. <laughs> the Astros are our Achilles heel. We gotta go in there, guns a blazing. Garrett Cole against his old team. He's gonna be bombing a hundred miles an hour to start the season. Soto, Judge, Volpe year two, Rizzo's healthy. And they go from Garrett Cole throwing a rocket hundred mile an hour fastball to start the season to like. Here's an 88 mile an hour fastball from Marcus Stroman to get up. <laughs> he doesn't really want to be here, but he's pretending he does, and he's just lobbing it in there. And oh, by the way, we have to play the Astros for four games to start this shit. So, and the and best. to add on to that, is Aaron Judge might miss it too. But Pat, you go first, and then we can get into that. The best thing ever would be that hypothetical, Sammy. I can just picture. Just picture the Sterling radio call. Nestor Cortez lifting up the leg, pausing. <laughs> Signature to mess with the key timer hitters. And the 2-2 two -two pick. Fuck home run. Uh, it's 7-0. Uh, huh. uh, Nestor wore his jean shoes to the field again. Nestor's, Nestor is cooked. Nestor he is had, so cooked. Hey, Nestor's I wearing his Canadian people. cleats today for opening day. That was the most... <laughs> Canadian because the tuxedo, the most obvious regression guy ever. And you know, I felt like I felt like everyone thought I was just being a hater. I'm like, look, look at all the numbers. It all says like luck and like it's not gonna last. And then he just turned into a pumpkin. The guy throws like a pus fastball with no plus breaking stuff. Did you think that guy was gonna magically keep having success? It just, oy vey. Anyway. Let's let's get into this judge stuff because we yeah. could uh we could get a hashtag Pat's prognosis with Dr. P part two here. Do we uh, even know like what's up with judge? Isn't it like an ab thing? Yeah, basically all we know to this point is that he was supposed to or they they actually they lied. He came out of their spring training game a day or two ago after just two at bats, like before anyone else came out, and a bunch of Yankee fans started freaking out. And then Aaron Boone told the media, yeah, like that was the plan for today. It was just two at bats, like no big deal. And then it turned out, nope, that was a lie. He went to get an MRI on his abs and he won't swing a bat until later this week. He says his goal is to play opening day, but like it's like definitely a we'll see how things go. Pat, Great. MRI on the abs. I feel like I've never heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know what was the was it after an at bat? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we know when whatever happened yeah. happened happened. Um, I know nothing here. Just knowing baseball players. Um, sounds like maybe a little oblique strain. Yeah, I mean, it's like yeah, very much so like a oblique strain. Uh, lingers for a couple of weeks. The thing that sucks, especially with like baseball with an oblique, is your obliques. Depending on which one, when you swing a bat, it does the your trunk rotation. So if you have pain contracting that muscle, swinging does not feel great. Mm -hmm. So he probably swung weird or made contact. We I don't know how I don't know the MOI. So so it's always something with him. It's always something. Yeah. So I mean, it sounds like probably oblique. I would say, depending on the grade, how bad the strain is, maybe opening day. Yeah. No, it's but, not. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, obliques, obliques and hammies. Those two things suck as baseball players. So. And it's going to linger, like especially obliques. Every strain, every pull lingers with you. Hammies come up a lot more. Groins come up a lot more. And uh, yeah, obliques not going to feel special. great. Yeah, the obliques not going to feel great if that's what it is. But yeah, if he had an oblique strain, they'd do MRI. 
It's fine though. Like that's, I feel like this isn't a big deal because Judge is still on a rookie deal. He's not making that much money. He's only dollars <laughs> a year. So, yeah, good for the Yankees. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't want to. I just want to be careful. I don't want to speculate too much on stuff that we we don't have the facts on. But you know, I'll say it again. Even though it's the Yankees, I don't want to see this happening. I want them to lose with their full team on the field. I want Judge to go zero for five with a fly ball to the warning track that would have tied it but didn't. And uh, yeah, but hey, Red Sox got an injury too. Uh, you know, the Yankees lose their big right-handed power bat. So did the Red Sox. It's true. Rob, Rob Ref Snyder. Quickly before we do Rob Ref Snyder, give me predictions here. I thought, I think it's interesting just because these injuries, like whether they're long-term or not, force you to look at what the team is going to look like for the Yankees without those guys. I made a, I made a whole six-part parlay for division winners this year. And I, the Yankees are the favorite on FanDuel. I think I made it on. I didn't pick them. I picked Baltimore to win the division. What place do you guys think the Yankees finish in? Understanding that we don't know the full extent of these injuries. So they could be nothing. They could be everything. Or at least for Cole, it could be everything. Um, Third or fourth, depending on how well the Rays do. The Rays do their like black magic and create four more really good starters to go with Pepiot while McClanahan and Springs are out. Then I think they'll finish third. I think it's going to be at least is a little bit more wide open than people think like Baltimore, Baltimore, you know, Burns has declined three years in a row. Still a good pitcher, but he's, you know, he's slowing down a teeny bit. Bradish seems like he's ready to pitch through an injury. They also don't have means again. They lost Bautista for the year. So they don't have their closer. They switched to Kimbrell. That's a pretty huge downgrade in my opinion. The Blue Jays have a good rotation. The offense is solid. Bullpen is pretty shaky. That's probably the most sure thing, quote unquote, the Blue Jays. Like, I'm not saying they're going to be great. I'm just saying they're the most predictable. Rays, who the fucking knows about the Rays? I have no idea. And then the Yankees are, like, totally contingent on injuries all of a sudden. I I shouldn't even say all of a sudden. This has been their thing for the last, like, seven years. They have, like, the most brittle team of all time. And then the Red Sox, I'm dude, Red Sox get like Jordan Montgomery, Michael Lorenzen, and these Yankees injuries are like a little bit legit. Then yeah, they could fight for fourth, but it's pretty unlikely. Uh, yeah, that's my thing. So I'm gonna go Orioles, Blue Jays, Yankees for now, but we'll see with the injuries. Rays, Red Sox fifth. So you have them in third. Yeah, third. Pat. He's, yeah. Pat. Pat. What do you got? I got. Orioles, Yankees, Rays, Blue Jays, Red Sox. Ooh, Blue Jays hater. Yeah, I, I think I until they prove me wrong and match what the team should be on paper, I'm always going to doubt them. I'm always going to take their under on wins until they prove me wrong. It's interesting. I, like this year, though, I also, they- I'm a big, mm. I wouldn't say hater. I fully expect Jose Berrios like regression again. Yeah, I could see that. The thing that with the Blue Jays is they're great. They're they're worse on paper, I think, depending on how much you value Matt Chapman. But one thing they have that they haven't had, like that team, obviously for years has had a leadership problem. They haven't had yeah. anybody, and now you bring in Justin Turner, and if Joey Votto's on the team, if he makes that roster, then you got him too. Like that could change things. So we'll see. For me, I've got them in second. Sammy, I forget if this matches what you said. It might. I've I've got Orioles, Blue Jays, Yankees, Rays, Red Sox. Was that yours, Sammy? Yeah, make contingent on the injuries. I'd swap the Rays and the Yankees if the Cole thing is legit. If Cole if Cole is out for the year or anything, like yeah, I don't I don't know if the Yankees finish above fourth. <laughs> like, but we can't we can't go down that road. It, at least yeah. yet. I, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sold on the Orioles. Still, they got a bunch of. They're so young, man. They're so young, and uh, I just not. None of these teams. I'm really sold. I think they're. I think every team in the AL East will have like a winning record, but I don't think any of them are like the Astros or the Rangers or. No, anything. they don't. There's no like. There's no like Braves or or Dodgers or anything, and like the, the Orioles, I think, are the. It's surprising to me that they're not the favorites because they feel like the most foolproof team up there. And like it feels like they 
I know I understand there's holes in their rotation, but like they did get Burns. I understand he's regressed, but like he's way better than anything that they've yeah. had. And like their Brad, offense, their offense hasn't lost anything, and they're only going to gain things. Like they have a bunch of great young hitters coming up. You're going to have Gunnar Henderson, who's not going to struggle for two months this year, like he did last year. Like they're that's a good team, and then they're going to get better. And then years down the road, they're going to start spending money. It could get scary. I think the loss, the loss of Bautista is huge because, like last year, the pressure in the seventh and eighth inning when you're playing the Orioles is massive because you know once you get to the ninth, you're cooked because you got the mountain coming out and he's just going to shut you down. And now you got Craig Kimbrell, who's been beyond shaky, still a good mm-hmm. closer, but beyond shaky the last few years, especially in October. Sorry, Phillies fans. So. I'm just not – I think that's a huge loss that people are kind of glossing over. But we'll see. It's bullpen. I have, very a, much so. I have a take. Let's Craig Kimbrell will not be the Baltimore closer by the All-Star break. Cano? I agree yeah. with you, Pat. I the think he loses Cano. that job. What's he going to do, though? They're just going to DFA yeah. him? He, he will, like, not pitch in any other role. He said that. I, Yenier Cano is so good. I never even understood why they signed Craig Kimbrell. They shouldn't have. They should have signed, like, a like a Ryan Stanek guy for half the money. Who's like well, honestly signed probably fucking better. David Robertson for I mean, like I'm not, four I'm not million? Fully sold on Yenier Cano. He kind of like I mean he had a really good season and everything, but he's pitched. He pitched. He has 72 major league innings. So we'll see. He, he he could fall off a cliff. I don't think anyone would be surprised. I, I I think he'll do well, but it wouldn't shock me if he didn't. He's a reliever. So volatile. Volatile is the name of the day. And uh, also, kind of didn't he kind of fall off towards the end? Like he had like a little a, bit. RA and then it blew up by a run. He's also got a he doesn't he, strike. He figured guys. it out a little bit. He like he fell apart, and then I I want to say, and I'd have to double check this, but like my memory tells me that he fell apart and then he rebounded a little bit, wasn't quite as dominant, but rebounded a little bit. Couldn't you see like Kimbrel? Like it, it just screams to me like he's gonna lose that job in like June or May, maybe even May, and then they're gonna put him in low leverage roles. They're gonna be like, oh, we're gonna he's gonna work his way back up and take that job again. And then in like deadline, they're getting a reliever. Kimbrel, I don't know. Maybe he stays on the team and pitches only low leverage. Maybe he gets DFA. I don't know. I just don't really have that much faith in the guy as much as I loved his time with Boston. But Gordo, uh, last, what was this? July, Cano, four and a half ERA. <clears throat> August, zero ERA. Ooh. And then September, 5.79 ERA. So he's a reliever, okay. man. You never know. You they never do fall know. apart. They do they, fall apart. Matt Barnes, we thought he was a great closer. The future fell apart. So gave, gave him that extension instant, instantly after they gave him the extension. It, there was not one. There was like no good outing in between the extension and the and the regression. It was just sign the. Ex- I I always I always feel like he like knew that his arm was like going, and he just was like, let's get this thing done, and then we'll go from there. But let's let's talk some Rob Ref Snyder, some Sox outfield stuff before we before we finish up here. So Ref Snyder today as we record Tuesday got hit by a pitch in the in his pinky toe and he got he got x-rays. He has a small crack in that pinky toe and he was seen in a walking boot after. And I know that like sometimes these little things like you can play on and sometimes you just got to shut it down and they really didn't give any updates. So obviously everything here is speculation, but I want to, for the third Pat's prognosis of the day, I want to kick it to Pat to see what you're thinking when you hear that he has a small crack in his toe. I mean, where do you think that goes? Um, yeah. Uh, he'll be in a boot for, I would imagine a couple of weeks. Um, I didn't see the pitch. I literally am just hearing about this right now. Um, Yeah, so he'll be in a boot, I would imagine, for depending on the crack and how bad the break is, I would say four weeks. Probably reassess in like four weeks. Um, In terms of roster building, though. No, no, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, do you think that this is... Like there's things that you can play on. I don't know. Small crack. Like who knows? Like, I don't know. Is that one of those things that's like you can kind of play through? Or is that something where they're just going to shut it down? Um, I don't know. If it shows like a hairline fracture, which is like the tiny like crack. Um, I would imagine they wouldn't even risk it, especially with a season hasn't even started. 
and he's yeah. uh, like a platoon outfield bat, I would imagine they'll play, play pretty conservatively. And what I was just going to say is they would be extremely smart to play conservatively because if he's out for four weeks, you put him on the IL. That gives you a pretty good, by the time he rehabs in his back, four to six weeks of really seeing what the outfield looks like. And if Willier Abreu is a major league outfielder or a platoon outfielder, because if he's not, perfect. You send him down to AAA, you don't have to release Rob Ref Snyder. He's back in the major league lineup on the bench. Yeah, it really is interesting because it feels just like some of these injuries have opened up opportunities for guys to show what they are. And like, yeah. we'll talk outfield here. Outside of Ref Snyder, the Sox have five outfielders to play with. Not even just like on the active, like this is on the 40 man. So you've got Yoshida, Duran, O'Neill, Rafaela, Abreu, Reyes and Bobby can play a little bit of outfield, but we're for the sake of discussion, we can leave them out of this because like they're not going to be considered for stuff like that. It's interesting because I had always been under the impression that you probably wouldn't want to have both Rafael and Abreu on the roster at the same time. But if Ref Snyder starts the season on the IL, you might be able to swing it. Yeah, I would imagine. Bare minimum, I think if it is a legit like cracked bone and it is like a partially or completely broken bone, I would say four weeks is like the when you get your real timeline. Four weeks from now is when reassess, see how the bone healed, see if he can come out of the boot, all that. If he's good at four weeks, he rehabs, I would guess, for a week or two. So you're at the six-week mark. If it's a worse break than that and he needs like six weeks in the boot, you're looking at like May. So and it, like, it's going to be, it's gonna be a lot. Yeah. And like I said, like he, we've talked about it last show. Like he's one of those guys that is so on the fence in terms of a roster spot that no one wants to get hurt and everyone wants to play. But in terms of job security, it like it might actually pan out for him because if guys like Willie or Abreu, what if Sedan stinks? Like, or or if someone gets hurt, like exactly. So, we've seen it, all it takes is one. But as you're saying, Pat, like yeah, on the bubble for a roster spot, he just got that extension last year, but he's only making 1.85 million this year, and yeah. next year is just a team option with a, a very small buyout. So yeah, like Rob Ref Snyder, there's been articles written. I want to say Mass Live has been all over all over this one about whether Rob Ref Snyder could be a guy you could see traded or DFA'd. But him starting the season on the IL, you'd get to see some guys like, as you said, Pat. Maybe maybe Rafaela isn't ready to hit in the majors. Maybe William Abreu isn't as good today as we saw him at the end of last season. Maybe one of those guys needs to go to AAA for seasoning. And if that's the case, like, yeah, you're going to need Rob Ref Snyder. So if you traded him before the season, you would regret that if one of those guys didn't work out. But there's a lot of different alignments you could roll with with ref Snyder on the bench. Let me, I wrote a couple down. It, let me, you may, maybe you're able to follow. It's like, there's a lot of moving parts here, but the way I have it versus righties would be Yoshida DH Duran left field, Rafaela center field, Abreu right field and O'Neill and Crone sit, or you could sub in O'Neill for Rafaela and then Rafaela and Crone sit. And then against lefties Crone DHs, Yoshida's in left, Rafael is in center, O'Neill's in right, and then Abreu and Duran sit. So basically, you're sitting Abreu for sure against left against lefties, and you're sitting Crone for sure against righties. And then against righties, you're sort of figuring it out who you want to sit out of O'Neill and Rafaela. And then we'll see how Duran does against lefties if he forces his way into the lineup against those guys too. But for now, I would say Rafaela should get every single game against lefties. Yeah. I would just I would just play Rafael every day. I just wonder, man. I know he's killing it. I know he's killing it right now. But What's playing the, why, in, why? Why? I just don't think you gain anything by platooning him. You, like we we all agree it's a bridge year. Just let him. Just let but him like, do it. but like, if how what percentage of games? I'm trying to think because what percentage of games do you think are started by righties versus lefties? It's got to be like 70, 30. 70, 30. Yeah. So he starts every one of the 30, and then he splits the 70. What does that mean? That means he plays 
two thirds well, of the games. Why? What's the point of that? That's that's all I'm saying is what's the what's the benefit of that? Because I Other feel like getting him rest. Because I feel like if you're not if you're playing Raphael every day, that means Tyler O'Neill is a strict platoon only playing against lefties. And Tyler O'Neill is a better player today. But he's not as important. He's on a one year deal. Rafael is your premier prospect. I'd rather the prospect in a bridge year, I'd rather the prospect get the bulk of the playing time. And I don't I'm I'm not necessarily sold that O'Neill's a platoon guy. We talked about it last week or last episode, excuse me. But Willier might not make the roster. So at this point, I don't know if he should. A guy really with an should. option like that who hasn't played well in spring. I I'm fine with that too. I per I I don't think that you should be sacrificing Tyler O'Neill at bats to get both Rafael and Abreu in the lineup. But if if uh, Ref Snyder doesn't make the roster because he's on the IL, now what? You'd have you'd have four outfielders, but one of them is your DH. Well, we we already got to sit O'Neill a little bit. He's he's incredibly injury prone. He's shown that over the last two years. He's it might not be a bad thing to have him sit a bit and just let him get hot and not get injured, you know, like, I don't know it, it, if it's a bridge year, then you should be thinking about the future rather than trying to win a few games this year. Like you heard Breslow say it. Don't want to sacrifice future wins for the short term or whatever he says. Like, but shouldn't you get to that point first? Like, I know we think it's a bridge year, but shouldn't you play April trying to win every game? And like, if they're fucking like 10 and 15 at the end of the month, then it's like, okay, we know what this team is, but shouldn't you at least see that that's what they are before you start thinking like, all right, we have to start prioritizing the young guys. Like no, they'll get I'd, those I'd at bat. I'd rather send the message of like, you are the young guys, you're the future. Let's go win games. You can win games for us too. Just what I just don't see the long view. I don't see the point of prioritizing Tyler O'Neill over these young guys. And I'm not saying like, bench the guy but if 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 rafael is on the roster i would play him pretty much every day he's young he's going to give you defense every single day that doesn't slump and he's giving you speed he's going to about low in the order too it's not like he's your three hole guy it's not like costas last year where you need him to hit he's rafael is there for his glove so i don't know i i think i'm actually leaning towards thick Willie and triple a to start the season just because the roster is weird and you want him getting every day at bats. And I, I, there's no scenario where I would have envisioned that a month and a half ago, but it makes sense now with Rafaela exploding and you need the defense, especially with how bad the defense is on the infield. You need to make up for it somehow, some way. So you do it in center. I don't know. I want him playing. If, if he's going to start on the major league roster, I want him in there 90% of the time. Sammy, I agree with you. If if Rob before the ref Snyder injury, that's that's the road I would have taken. I would have said thick Willie and triple to start the year. I just don't know if you can afford to do it with the like because think about it. If if you start a lineup one day and it's Yosh so say Williams and Triple A, your lineup yeah. on this particular day is Yoshida's DHing, Duran in left, Rafael in center, Abreu in right, and oh, sorry, not Abreu, O'Neill in right. O'Neal, yeah, and my bad. Yeah, I, I nodded, but I knew what you meant. Yeah, one of those guys goes down. <laughs> then what? Like it's like Yoshida can play left, but he's DHing. So yeah, you put him in the field. Now you got to have the pitcher hit. Oh, you mean like in the game? Oh, yeah, I mean you can always figure out. Innings. That's different. That's a few innings. Whatever. That's not a big deal. I thought you meant like long term. Well, also no, that. Well, okay, no, also that. Yoshida can play left, but now who's your now who's your reserve outfielder? Because they don't even have one on the. It's, it's Bob, dude. It's Bob like or Pop. Like, like if an injury happens in the middle of the game. No, no, I'm talking about even after the game. Now, now for the 15 day IL period or whatever. So now, oh, Ref Snyder's gone, but they don't have another outfielder on the 40 man on outside of if you count Bobby. Like they don't have one. You probably just got to start Yoshida in left field and DH. Roman, no, no I'm kidding. <laughs> Just fucking do it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, Rob, Ref Snyder's got a cracked toe. It's not like he's got a broken leg, so I'm not. I mean, Pat, did you – I can't remember. Did you already say how long that is? Did you say like four weeks? He said probably reassess in four weeks, but I would say his like return, six, eight weeks, if it's a legit crack. Get a new toe, bro. We've said to you, Pat, you watched, uh, you watched some fights over the weekend. Those guys probably fought with broke toe, broken toes. Come on, Ref. If it were me, I just wouldn't have broken my toe, you know? Yeah, Cheeto fought with a broken face. He got robbed. Oh, I saw that. His house got robbed, like today. Did he? 
Oh. That was bad, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, I, and I've said this before, Yoshida is a bad defender. It's not like Hanley out there. It's not like Valdez at second base. No, he could play out there. Yeah. You're okay. So with that. let's go Sox, dude. Honestly, I'm just, be, I'm just being serious. Go Sox. Any enough said before we get out of here, guys? I got one. Let's hear yeah, it. I do. Right, you go first. I am... 85% sure that Calvin Ridley will not be a New England Patriot. <laughs> Get this negativity out of there. I kind because of agree with you. <laughs> it's very odd the way that his free agency is shaking out. Because Patriots have had an offer on the table all day. Sure, he's trying to leverage the Jags, see what he can get. Likes being in Florida, no income tax, all that fun stuff. If he waits until 4.01 p.m. tomorrow, the Jaguars give up a third round pick instead of a second round pick to the Falcons for re-signing him. This just sounds like someone who's doing the organization he's going to go to a favor. I agree with that, Pat. Well, and he's bum then. Let me read some quotes because I send them to my buddy from Mark Daniels of Mass Live. He says, they have what I'm told is a strong offer out to Calvin Ridley who may not want to come to New England, so stay tuned. So he says, if I had to guess, this drama gets wrapped up tomorrow, so if you're listening on drop day, that means today. But the sense I get is that people inside Gillette Stadium wouldn't be surprised if Ridley ends up back in Jacksonville. But crazier things have happened in free agency. We'll see. And then someone asked him about potential trade stuff after this. And this was my enough said, too. So this will count as mine. I was going to talk about free agency, too. Uh, he said, that's a great question. I'm not sure that Brandon Ayuk, T. Higgins, or Keenan Allen are realistic trades option, Realistic trade options. Things can change, but I wouldn't hold my breath. So it's kind of scary. Scary hours here. It's I love what... Bust. I, I love what they've done so far. I think keeping your guys, keeping your good players is important. I know people are pissed off about what running it back or whatever. You got to keep your good players. They weren't bad because of those guys last year. Like getting Josh Uche back cheap is really good. Like keeping Michael Wenu is huge. You need the receiver. You need the tackle. Tyron Smith, come on, let's go. And they got to draft a quarterback at three. But if they don't get that wide receiver done. Yeah, I know who those guys are. And then Smith, great ad. Yeah. He's so good at um, block. Yes, yeah, very good, Sam. Yep. Yeah, he blocks. Yeah, big dude. Yeah. Hey, when I follow football, I know like everything about the Patriots. Nothing about any of the other teams. They all suck, and I don't care. So, do you play fantasy football? Uh, I have, but I'm not doing it this year. I don't think. Did you do it last year? Like, do you know who any like the every running back in the league changed teams? Oh, like I know, I know all the good fantasy players from fantasy football, but like right. linemen or like a defensive end, like I'm not gonna. Know. I know like Danielle Hunter and like the big guys, like Burns. I heard when he got traded yesterday, I was like, oh shit, he's mm -hmm. good. I texted my coworker who's a Giants fan. I was like, dude, look. He was like, no way. Um. <laughs> anyway, uh, we good? My enough said. Yeah, yeah, let's hit you enough said, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap this. All right, you concerned about defense? I have a not so good update for you, Red Sox fans. And this is from our new friend, Julian McWilliams, who joined us on WEEI over the weekend. He tweeted today at 1.51 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He said, game still fast for Valdez at second. He's talking about Emmanuel Valdez, who's currently slated to be the starting second baseman with Grissom hurt. It's going to be either him or Pablo Reyes. Someone asked him, Follow up. Is he the worst defensive second baseman you've ever seen? Worst defensive second baseman you've ever seen. That's the question. And Julian, in like two minutes, responds on the big league side without question. So you just you just extended Brian Bayo, who's a ground ball machine. You're talking about bringing in Jordan Montgomery, who's a ground ball machine. And you, the Boston Red Sox, are prepared to roll out Emmanuel Valdez at second base. While you have Rafael Devers playing third base. <laughs> oh, that is not good. That's bad, in fact. You got the worst defensive second baseman that some reporters have ever seen. And then Rafael Devers at third. Pray for Brian Bayo. And to add on to it, Sammy, Valdez this spring, he has a 174 batting average, 675 OPS. And the guy were, that you would talk about replacing him if... Valdez does not start the season in the lineup or on the roster. It would probably be Pablo Reyes. He's hitting 136 with a 457 OPS. And also one of those one of those uh, Valdez hits. Let's be real, foul ball. He had a home run 
pretty clear. No, 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 no way. Sam. No, pretty no. Clear. Foul ball over there, kid. Nah, he hit but it hard. He hit it regardless, hard. Regardless, regard. Actually, you know what? That's probably a home run at Fenway. Anyway, shorter. So, moot point. Anyway, but still, um, yeah, I just can't. I, I can't stomach starting that guy at second. I like his bat. The bat is solid. He can hit, but like. <laughs> You can't have that infield on a major league team, especially it's after bad. you were the 29th ranked defensive group out of 30 last year. I think the worst was only the Giants were worse. So, good God. I don't know what you do, though. Like, Reyes, I, to me, start Reyes. Reyes is an average defender. That's a to way, me, way better than Valdez. To me, I mean, the lineup you put out there on opening day doesn't have to be the lineup you put out there in game two, three, or four. I think you start off and you give them both at bats. I mean, Valdez is a lefty race is a righty. So you can just platoon him for a little bit and just see who takes that job. And if no one takes that job, I don't know how long Grissom's going to be out, but I think I've heard some good reports. I know Sean McAdam wrote a piece saying he's making some progress. Like he's not gonna be out crazy long. We hope. No, so hopefully like, like give him chances, small, like, and then Grissom update. just takes it. Yeah. Small update, small update. I just saw it's not good. Out. Yeah, did Valdez improve defense? <laughs> if he did, it's not noticeable. So let's hope he's not out there for too long. I'm going to keep my eye on it. I thought he looked a little bit better this spring, but I don't know. Not, not all the games are televised, so we only if see what got, we see. If he got twice as good as he was in 2023. Still bad. Still bad. <laughs> if he were twice as good, he would still, as he were last year, he would still be one of the worst. He would... He could be twice as good defensively as he was last year, and if he's the starting second baseman, he's probably still the worst defensive second baseman in baseball. If he got twice as good as he was last year, he'd be up in the second percentile of outs of average. Yeah. Yikes. And then Devers is fourth percentile, so there you go. Hey, no, Sammy. Devers is going to get to that 30. What would we say, 30? Did we say 30 is where he had 30. to get? 30 is all I want. I only want him to be... 3-0? <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to have only 70% of your contemporaries better than you at defense. Let's go. Uh, well, you know what? He's better than 98% of his contemporaries at the plate. So if he's better than 30% of them in the field, I'll take it, man. And that's why we love Rafi. Cause even when the defense is piss poor, that bat is, Ooh, my God, it's the best. There's like very few guys that watch hit than that tank machine. So, 40 home runs this year. Please. Anything else before we wrap this thing, guys? I'm good. That's it. Thank you, Pat, for your analysis. I try, I, I try to act like I get what you're saying, but really I'm just learning. So thank you. Appreciate Pat's it. prognosis. It's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. I like it. I like the how you give us like the dumbed down version. It's like more understandable. Yeah, like, I, I feel like I'm textbooks. I'd be like, this is like Arabic or something. I could follow yeah. it. Like I, when he's, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not on the YouTube channel for it because, like, it, it does help when he's pointing out specific areas. And we all we all love timetables. No one loved like it's hard to guess on timetables. Like we put Pat in a in a difficult position asking him to guess these timetables when he doesn't have like any of the MRI results or and like they're the media or sorry the the team is withholding these results and they're not telling the media anything. But we're just asking Pat to guess. But he does a good job of it. Pat's prognosis. It's a thing this year. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Yankees are just like, everything is fine, guys. <laughs> Don't worry about it, really. <laughs> We're the Yankees. Pinstripes, rings. Oh, everything's <laughs> fine. Fuck. <laughs> everything's yeah. fine. I'm playing Tessie, too. It's been episode 51. Uh, before you leave, before you leave, don't leave yet. Hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on the Odyssey app, Apple, Spotify, hit that subscribe button. Rate us that five stars and leave that comment. But also, check it out on the YouTube channel. Make sure to check out Pat's prognosis on the YouTube channel and then hit that thumbs up button and hit that subscribe button to the WEI channel. We've got our own playlist on there. It's freaking great. Follow us on the Instagram and the Twitter. Both of them are at Play Tessie. But for Sammy, for Dr. P, for Cooper the Pooper behind the screen, this has been Gordo for Play Tessie episode 51. Toodaloo.